and I'm Scarlett Fu with Bloomberg Quick Take, Bloomberg Radio, and Bloomberg Television. Welcome to the latest edition of the Cornell Tech at Bloomberg Speaker Series, where every month I sit down with leading figures in global technology. We're talking about entrepreneurs, investors, and thinkers. And our goal is to bring you engaging conversations, to produce new insights, and also raise some compelling questions. So if you want to catch up on our prior episodes, check out the Inside Bloomberg page on YouTube. You can also stream our podcast, which is Cornell Tech at Bloomberg, on all the different major platforms. In this month's edition, we are joined by Sebastian Simonetkovsky. He is co-founder and CEO of the Swedish fintech startup Klarna. The payment firm's buy now, pay later service has been steadily picking up market share. And in fact, it now has more than 90 million customers worldwide. Sebastian, thank you so much for joining us in person. Thank you for having me. And it's your first trip overseas in a while. Yes, indeed. I haven't been here to New York since COVID actually started. So it's so exciting to see you here. Very much. We like to kind of take a step back and understand where you come from, your roots and your story. So you're a child of Polish immigrants. Yes. Uh, were you born in Poland? No, I was actually, I was born in Sweden. My, sister, my, my older sister was born in Poland. And then my, my parent uh, fled for a better life. And so, uh, so I was born in Sweden. But up. they grew up, or you grew up, speaking Polish with them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how did that, I mean, I, I'm guessing that that contributes to a sense of being an outsider mm -hmm. in the country that you were born in. How did that drive you towards uh, making a decision on what you wanted to do later on? Well, I think if nothing else, I mean, I believe that, like, I mean, it, it's changed so much as well. Because back in those days, it was still communism, and Poland was behind the Iron Curtain. And I remember, like, among my friends when I was, like, eight, nine years old, they would refer to Poland as like the country that was spewing out toxic waste into the Baltics. That was kind of their, that was what the, it was associated with. And so, and, and in general, Sweden was not the easiest society to integrate to because of the language. And, and that point time was very, very difficult, right? So I remember like being teased for being Polish and stuff like, I wouldn't say bullied, but definitely teased. Uh, and yes, it did create like uh, this difference. Like, I, I mean, I was in a school with kind of regular kids but obviously, financially speaking, we were worse off than most of my friends. And I do think that my parents being academical backgrounds, but you know, not being able to put that into practice in, in Sweden due to that. And my father was unemployed for a couple of years. He also drove a cab and, and my mother was an early retiree. So there was definitely that sense that I do think the second generation of immigration kids come with, which is a little bit of like you, your parents sacrificed their lives to kind of give you a better future. And you feel like somewhat responsible for trying to somehow like you know give some or do something about it and, and kind of you feel that you could have a better life right like or right. you should do something to get a better life you were very entrepreneurial as a child weren't you yeah I, I, I it's kind of all I don't really know where it came from but I remember like I was reading like already like a 12 13 year old I was reading like Richard Branson's book about virgin and and and, and you picked and, that up on your own as a 12 or 13 yeah year old. I know it's crazy <laughs> And same thing, I mean, obviously the big entrepreneur of Sweden was the founder of Ikea, Ingvar Kamprad, who was like the, you know, the god mm -hmm. uh, in that sense. And then just early on, I, I was, I've been reflecting on it. I did so many different things. I tried to like, you know, um, s s I realized we had like a bicycle lane outside our house where a lot of people were bicycling. So it's like a lot of traffic, foot traffic. That means a lot of customers. So I was trying to like make, uh, get my sister to start like factory making pictures and paintings and trying to sell them to people that would pass by. I had all these ideas. and. I remember being upset with our local radio station. I thought the, the programming was very bad. So I called them as like a 13 year old and started providing the advice of how they should change their programming to increase their number how of listeners. And uh, not so well. I think they kind of listen nicely, kindly, and then kind of hang up. And, um, you know, and I'm not sure my advice was that, was that uh, you know, accurate. But I don't know why. I just like always, always passionate about like doing things, testing things, trying things. And business somehow attracted me early on. And you also give the Swedish government credit for some of your success because it, because it had its program where it would basically give every family or allow every family in Sweden to have a computer so that the kids would grow up with an understanding of how to use computers. Yeah, I think I, th I, th I strongly believe that one of society's biggest responsibilities is to provide everyone with kind of the best, best prerequisites to do whatever you know they want to do in life and excel in life right and i think that as much as we talk about the american dream sweden is actually one of the societies in the world with the highest social mobility so the number of people coming from kind of low income background to high income background is actually higher in sweden than in the us according to statistics and i do think that part of that is tied to the fact that it's free health care free education and so it's really a society that's built around the fact that if you do want to do something with your life you know, society's set up in such a way that nothing should kind of stop you from ach achieving that. 
not your background, not where you're coming from. And, and, and one thing that the government did in addition to that, which was interesting, is that when I was 13 years old, we couldn't really afford a computer back then. A computer was like $2,500 yeah. or something. Yeah. And so the government decided to subsidize computers, um, which was when we got our first computer. So, uh, you know, it was called PC at home reform. And, and that's when we bought our first com computer. And I think that, again, like if you look at a lot of, um, I think Sweden, uh, Stockholm has the most fintech per capita in the world after Silicon Valley. And I think a part of that was just because very early computer literacy mm -hmm. due to reforms like that, mm -hmm. in combination with people who, you know, were ambitious and wanted to do something different and learned early on to, comp to program and, and, and learned computers. And I think you see the, the results of that. Right, and you're a perfect example of that, that computer literacy plus just a curiosity about mm -hmm. striking out on your own. So Klarna is the second company that you've ever worked for? Is that right? Uh, no, it's not. Actually, I had tons of jobs before okay. I started Klarna. My first year was at Burger King. <laughs> um, so that was fun. I was 15 years old and I, uh, you know, it was interesting. I did that like an extra job while I was in school and then I had tons of jobs. I've been a teacher. I've been working like with elder care. I've been, uh, you know, um, I've been a bartender, bar waiter, a sales guy. You know, I've done tons of jobs actually. Okay, and you were working at a factory when you kind of saw how things worked there and you kind of got this idea for what Klarna would become. Can you no. explain what happened? No, it was actually a factoring firm. So it was a like, a, firm? yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> but it was, um, so basically what happened was, I mean, I went to uh, uh, the stock. What's Google. a factoring firm, first of all? So it's, you know, it's a company that offers factoring services, account receivables for, for services, financial services for other companies, basically. Okay. Paper and pusher. In a way, yes. Uh, and so I think, I mean, the point was that I went to business school just after uh, college. Uh, and then, you know, after two years, I realized I wanted to do something else. So I went out. Uh, I traveled around the world without flying, which was my big trip, backpacking, really exciting. So far ahead, you know, now it's not so, uh, now everyone talks about not flying and right. because it's environmentally like bad. Greta. We were very, very early on that. Uh, but it was an amazing trip. I learned a lot. I came home and then I was just out of jobs and I couldn't go continue my studies because my, I had to wait for the next semester to start. Mm -hmm. And so I was just looking for a job and, and, and in the end I ended up working at this factoring firm. Uh, you know, account receivables firms as a sales guy. And I was just picking the phone and calling these companies trying to sell these services. Mm -hmm. And nobody was really interested. Everyone was like, ah, you know, we already have something, it works great, why would I switch? I don't care if we save the company $500 a, a year or whatever. Too much hassle. Yeah, exactly. But, but, there were, this is in 2004, so there were some small companies, entrepreneur driven, that had realized, you know what, like I can buy Google AdWords really cheap and then I'll get some traffic, and it was like early e-commerce companies, right? Mm -hmm. In a country that didn't have Amazon. Mm -hmm. So so like these companies started thriving, and they were like, wow, can you save me $500 a year? That's awesome, like I'm signing up, right? So so that really, so that I started like talking to these e-commerce companies, and I realized, wow, something's going on here, there's something that's interesting. And then I came up with this idea that they really need help with payments. Can I, you know, somehow, you know, solve payment services for them? But I was kind of done with that company. I was going back to my studies and I would have probably not started, but there was an incubator in my school who was like promoting pe students to start companies. You gotta remember, things have changed dramatically because back then, students at my school at least, 7% wanted to start a company. Today it's 70, right? Wow, That's yeah. just how much has shifted in those right, two decades. Right. And you know, after after you know the dot com crash, every, nobody wanted, everyone wanted to go to work for Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and you know big banks and stuff. So I was um, this was very odd, but but you know, I, I went there and presented the idea, and they and, and that's kind of how we started. So how has the idea of Klarna changed from when you first presented the idea to what it is now, which is basically synonymous with buy now pay later? Yeah. Well, actually, the the interesting thing is that we started in a debit card market. Mm -hmm. um, where most people had debit cards. And debit cards work great, and I generally recommend people to use debit cards. But when you shop online, the debit card isn't that great because what if like, I don't get the product that I'm seeing on the picture? Or what if I make a return, I have to wait three weeks for, a, for, for my money back? On a credit card, it doesn't really matter, it's just my balance. But on a debit card, it's my money. I want to yes. spend elsewhere, right? Yes. So, so what we realized is that a short form of credit when you're buying on a distance, when you're on e-commerce, actually makes a lot of sense. It solves a lot of problems for the consumers. It gives trust, simplicity, and so forth. So that was kind of the key thing. We grew that in the Nordics and in the German-speaking countries where the primary debit card markets. And then we thought like, oh, it would be fantastic to come to the US and UK. But these were credit card markets. So we didn't really see an opportunity here. So we kind of you know, grew the company and, and then you know, tons of other things happened we can come back to later. But really what happened eventually is we started realizing, you know what's going on? Actually, people in the US and the UK are abandoning credit cards. They're giving up on it. The younger generation don't believe in those models. They've heard how their, you know, their parents got in debt in 2007 and 8, 
Um, revolving create a lot of dirty tricks about how to get people overdraft fees. Mm -hmm. We hear about it all the time. Mm -hmm. So there's this anti-sentiment around the industry. And 50% of millennials in the US don't have a credit card. They only have a debit card. So then we realized that suddenly now, you know what? Market the, opportunity. Yes. This, 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 so, so rather than we figured US out, US became Sweden <laughs> in oh. a sense, right? Which is kind of funny. So, um, and, and that's really what, you know, part of the success that you've seen in the last years has really come from that. I wonder as well, because Sweden is kind of a, ca it's, it's touted as a cashless society, whether yes. that created an environment where people are willing to experiment with something like buy now, pay later. Yeah, I think it could be definitely that. But I also think, it, you know, it speaks to the core elements. People want simplicity, they want safety and occasionally they need credit for specific purposes, right? So I think it kind of, it, it plays into that. And then obviously today, I believe Fana does much, much, much more than this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our services are much wider than that. And mm -hmm. in, in a way, we're really a neobank competing in the, ne you know, uh, among the new up and coming banks that you're gonna see coming in this decade, I believe. But uh, it's kind of a different story. So if I'm a consumer mm -hmm. and I sign up for a Klarna, the buy now, pay later service, how does it work for me? And what am I paying up in terms of fee, in terms of interest? What are you, are you checking my credit score? Right, so it actually depends a little bit market by market. Um, we do soft credit checks sometimes, but we make sure they don't show up on your kind of, uh, you know, your credit score in general because people don't want that. Mm -hmm. But it's important for us, obviously, from an underwriting perspective to make it responsible mm -hmm. so that people don't uh, over, overspend using our product. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about the Buy Now Pay Later product, the way we've built it, uh, is that it is uh, interest free. It's, it's free, free for the consumer. It doesn't charge any fees for the consumer. So it's entirely based on charging merchant fees for it. Uh, and merchants are paying for it because they're seeing consumers rewarding them with higher average order value, bigger conversion rates and so forth. So it's kind of a, it, it's a healthy, I think, mix away from kind of the traditional credit card, which is all about revolving, getting you into debt, 29% interest rate, just pay a little bit less this month, don't worry. You know? And then you're kind of suddenly borrowing against all of your payments. I think in general installments is also a healthier concept. It's very clear, you're paying down the debt by a very you know, f you know, clear regularity. You're not just pushing it ahead of yourself for a long mm -hmm. period of time. So there's a couple of elements, but, but to the consumer, very simple. You go online, you choose it as a payment method. It costs you nothing. You can take a $100 purchase, split it $25 every second week, tie it to your salary cycle, and it's free of charge for the consumer. So you know, in that sense, a very beneficial service. And how long does it take to, to do that soft credit check? Is it instantaneous yes, because it's you use instantaneous, AI? Yes, instantaneous, yes. Okay. Hmm. And do most of your customers then have credit cards and they just choose not to use them, or is this instead of a credit card? No, I would say, I mean, a dominant form is really people with debit cards mm -hmm. uh, that want to shop online but find a debit card not to work well for them. And so that is the majority, but there's obviously people with credit cards as well that are starting to pick up. And, and, and tons of testament actually from consumers telling us, thanks to Klon, I stopped using my credit card and I started using this service instead, right? Because they find it better for themselves than the, the construct of the credit card with the revolving and the, and, and the high interest rates uh, mm -hmm. on the accounts. And, and the fees as well. And the fees, exactly. One thing the credit cards do offer is some kind of reward system, mm -hmm. some kind of loyalty point system. Is that something that you're offering as well? Yep, so we have a Vibes program. Um, which basically gives you rewards for all your purchases and so forth that you can enroll in and so forth, which is very, very popular as well, yeah. One thing that surprised me is that your fastest growing demo, as I understand it, is the 40 to 54 year old age group. We just talked about how millennials, some younger millennials, Gen Z, they don't really trust credit cards. They, mm -hmm. they saw what it did to their family. This is a cohort that grew up on credit cards and relies on credit cards. Mm. What does that tell you? No, but I, I, I do genuinely believe that it is consumer sentiment going against credit cards. I mean. Go to Netflix and see the latest, like, a Credit Cards Explained, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great series. You'll see 30 minutes just about all the dirty tricks that banks have applied to try to get us as consumers in over debt. Like, they put the credit limit and they push it into your face and say, oh, look, it feels like I have all this money to spend. It's not really the same thing as a, as a positive balance on your, on your debit account. So I think people have really woken up to the bad practices and they are looking for alternatives that are more favorable. And I think this is one alternative. And I think in general, if you look like 10 years down the road, if less people have credit cards, more people use debit, but then occasionally use buy now, pay later for specific purchases, I think it's a better world. What kind of specific purchases do you think? I think when you buy online is a very clear one, right? But there are also gonna be other situations. It might be like, you, you know, if you're a, um, if you are primarily using debit and you're a mother with children, right? It might be that suddenly you see an offer for a product that you couldn't afford right now, but if you use buy now, pay later, it becomes affordable and then you can buy it and then you have you know, access to a better discount, a better price that you otherwise would have missed out on. So I think you know, credit makes sense in specific occasions, but the idea of a credit card is to use it for everything. Mm -hmm. And I don't think credit in general, for example, for your groceries, you shouldn't use credit, you should use debit, right? Like you should use the money that you have. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the benefit of this product is that it's, you know, we always say to people like, 
use debit and then occasionally use credit when there's a, when it makes sense. But there is a subgroup of people who use their credit cards as debit cards. They pay off their balance every month. Yep. They don't carry a balance yes. and they collect the reward points mm -hmm. at the same time and yep. their credit limit goes up and their credit score improves. Mm -hmm. Why should those people then switch to something like buy now, pay later? Great question. I think that like, first and foremost, like some people just don't want to support those products at all. They're just against them, so they don't like them for that reason. Some people feel that they're you know, uh, ingenious in, in a sense, those products. But it, obviously, uh, adding the ability to improve your credit score is definitely on our kind of product roadmap. It's one thing that we believe is going to be you know, important in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then again, like we have a loyalty program and this. There's tons of other things that people don't reflect on with Klarna. Like, for example, every time you make a purchase with Klarna, um, we actually carry SKU level data. So we know not only that you bought for like $100 at, let's say, H&M, we actually yeah. know what sweater, what color, what size, and so forth. When you open our app and you see your purchase history, if you open your banking app, you barely understand what you purchased. It says something, transaction, or whatever. Yeah. In our case, you see images of the items that you bought. So if you then want to do a return or if you want to do an additional purchase, you have much richer data in our ecosystem than you would have in any other existing networks. So there's tons of these other, you can track your shipping, find out where your packages are. Um, you can contact customer service directly of the merchants through our app. So there's tons of other services that we built around this that actually add value. But usually, obviously, the buy now, pay later is kind of the entry point. That's mm -hmm. how people discover us and find, okay, this is an interesting service. I'm going to you know, try it out. Mm -hmm. But then over time, they learn there's tons of other savings of time, saving of money that is it's available. It's like a gateway to, to other services. Mm -hmm, for sure. Do you personally have credit cards? Uh, yes, I still do. But I actually have a Klarna card because in, in, uh, in Europe, we've now launched a plastic card as well. So. Mm -hmm. We have over a, almost a million people that signed up for it, so that's my primary. It says, uh, I can actually show it to you. Please. <laughs> it, it, I like it a lot. It's, uh, here we go. It says, use with caution. <laughs> it's a good thing for a card. <laughs> you can see. Fire there beware, you pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Um, are you philosophically against credit cards in a consumer-driven economy, or is, are you kind of neutral as just in, in the right circumstances? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously, I've been asked the question a couple of times, and, and I've been forced also to think about it, because to be honest, like when we started a company, it's not like we were, you know, we were just looking at, okay, credit could solve a problem when you shop online, mm -hmm. if you have debit cards, and then we just, you know, what was the business model of the other banks? Okay, they were making money this way, they were late fees, overdraft fees, uh, interest-bearing accounts, et cetera. So we just copied that and we just made it better digitally. Digitally native, you know, easy to use on an online environment and stuff like that. So I better user interface as well. Exactly, mm -hmm. right? That was the core of it. And then as we started growing, I remember like a few years into Klon, I suddenly was watching one day and I was looking at a forecast for the next year. I was looking like, wow, what is that revenue line? And I realized it was late fees. And when I looked, I was like, that is going to become a problem. Like, mm -hmm. people if this are going business, to be upset. yes, people are going to be upset. And if this is business model is going to be dependent on that revenue line, this is not going to be a long term sustainable business. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to our investors and told them that unfortunately, for a period of time, you're going to see our volume grow faster than our revenue, and you're going to see our margins shrink. And I think we were very, very happy to have a very supportive shareholder in Sequoia, who's been a long-term uh, you know, supporter of Klarna, who really supported that change of the they business model. They didn't push back against that. No, I think they really saw the long-term opportunity that you know, it meant. Some other investors were more short-term, so they were a little bit tougher mm -hmm. in the conversations. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the, their sub Sequoia support in that sense really allowed us to kind of change that business model and go, move away from it. And that was when I started reflecting on the fact that like, you know, Credit is good for specific purposes, but it's also one of those products that can actually create problems, right? Yeah. So it became even more important for me to really look at like, how does our losses compare to credit cards, for example? And we see currently we're about 30, 40% below industry standards uh, in losses. Our underwriting also worked differently because on a credit card you apply and then you suddenly get a limit and yeah. you go out and spend it. For us, you get like maybe a $100 credit and then you see, we look whether you can, you know, whether you use it in a responsible way and you pay it back and then you get it to another $200. So we kind of grow slowly up that um, uh, experience with the customer to really make that assessment and it's always a per transaction decision from our side. Mm. So there are things like that we've implied and I think that's, but I think, you know, one way, I always reflect on the fact when I saw that revenue line, I could have said, oh, let's get out of here, let's, right. let's buy, but let's, let's sell the company and get mm -hmm. out of this, right? Because it's going to become a problem someday. But then I, I thought it was much more interesting to, to see it as a challenge and see, okay, how do we build a credit product that is actually better for the consumer, mm -hmm. that is long-term sustainable, actually works better? Mm -hmm. And I mean, see it now is just a few days ago, a major big bank in the U.S., announced that they were uh, removing overdraft fees. Yes. So I think the industry is waking up to this, that 
they have had an unhealthy business model. And I think if we can be part of you know, helping to transform that into a better direction, like that's a pretty cool uh, accomplishment. Yeah, Capital One did just that, and of course a couple of other banks will probably feel the pressure. And this is an industry that makes like $15 billion a year in revenue yes. off of those kinds of fees. I think it was like somebody said that like, there's three times more money being made in the U.S. from overdraft fees than burglary. So like you're disrupting <laughs> the financial industry in many ways um, with the buy now, pay later service. You had talked about how it took off in Sweden, in Northern mm -hmm. Europe, um, where debit cards were much more in use than credit cards. And this was also a success in Australia and the UK, and now you're, you're seeing it expand in the US. What about the rest of the world? What about Asia, mm -hmm. um, where there's a high savings rate and perhaps less propensity to spend on credit? What yeah. about Latin America? What do you see there? Well, I do think there's uh, tons of opportunity for us, but maybe slightly different. In Latin America, installments has been a natural part of payments for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. So if we come there, I think it's more with our other services that we provide, the skew level data, the richness of the data, the, you know, the other value points that we have. If you look at Asia, I think that in general, what's kind of interesting a little bit with financial services is that the big traditional markets are actually, in my opinion, the most attractive while the new and emerging markets are much more competitive. Like if I go to an ATM machine in Russia, I can do 50 times more things than I can do in an ATM machine in Sweden or in the US, right? Uh, and the same applies to a lot of Southeast Asian countries, China not the least and so forth. So, and, and even take Africa where we talk about M-Pesa and travel, you know, transferring money over mobile phones, stuff like that. It's really come really recently here. It's been around there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we really focus on like the more uh, you know, incumbents, uh, e economics, uh, e economical places from that perspective, like a Japan or a South Korea and something. I see. Because I think that competition there is actually less than people think. Um, there is more opportunity and obviously, you know, sizable markets. And you have entrenched players who may maybe have gotten a little complacent and too accustomed and too comfortable with the I way things so. are. I think so. I think so. I think we're going to see a, tr you know, a tremendous, uh, you know, I, because I, I saw this when I started in 2005 with my co-founders. You know, e-commerce at that point of time, people were still telling me, like, nobody's going to buy clothes online. Like, that was still, like, the, the verdict we got from investors, right? And then in 2009 and 10, something really started happening. You know, you started seeing Amazon really becoming a dominant player. In Europe, you had people like Zalando and others. And, and you started seeing that it was in this transition, but there was a lot of, you know, talk in the street. Like, Amazon's not profitable. It's never going to work. Mm -hmm. Zalando this, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. But it was the beginning, and now 10 years later, we look at it and it's like, obvious, they were successful and they've taken massive market shares. I think what we're seeing now in kind of in this disruption of retail banking is we're at the same point in time. We have a couple of neo banks coming in, we have a couple of new players, the same discussions, they're not profitable, they're not meant to business model work, but they're taking market share, and it's still early. And I genuinely believe that by the end of this decade, we are going to see a massive change of the overall landscape of retail banking. Kind of in the same way that people said you, can, you can't buy clothes online or anything. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about your merchant partners um, because unlike stores in the past that offer, offered installment plans, which were store by store, you're offering a platform to the different partners to, to, mm -hmm. uh, for this service to their customers. What makes a good merchant partner? Are, are there types of merchants that you think should offer buy now, pay later service and those that shouldn't? Um, good question. I think. It depends a little bit, right? Because it's also always difficult to know, uh, even if you go to some, I don't know, let's take uh, food delivery services, right? I don't really believe that in general, a food delivery service should offer you a pay in four installment, like a pizza for in four installments, is not necessarily associated with what I think is responsible credit. However, there might be occasionally what we've seen in Europe is we have another product which allows you to not pay now, pay 30 days later. So it's just a transformation. And sometimes when you're, you know, a lot of people on their debit cards don't have any money by the end of the, of the salary. And then it might give them the short term credit to pay that afterwards. Could make sense. So it's almost like you have to look at it. Uh, Post date it, basically. Yes, exactly. And I think that, but again, we just launched in the US now pay now, which means that you pay the full amount with us, a little bit like a wallet, like PayPal, where you have different funding sources. So we really see this opportunity in all sectors uh, for Klarna, mm -hmm. and we want to grow it broader. I think, again, the buy now, pay later has been kind of the, the way to open the market, yeah. and it's created a lot of buzz and interest in the company. But to us, currently, we can work with all types of, um, of retailers mm -hmm. and, and, and services. And so we have, for example, in Europe already a big base of subscription, like 
Disney Plus and Spotify mm -hmm. and stuff like that. We want to obviously bring those relationships to the US as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there's tons of other services around payments where we, uh, where we can offer you know, value. The merchant fees that you do charge, they are a higher percentage of sales than credit card sales. Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing merchants pass through these, these fees onto their customers? No, not at the moment. I mean, we don't. And I think over time, I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. I think that you have had, the whole in payments industry has almost been like two extremes. Mm. You've had on one side what I don't refer to as payment schemes, but extortion schemes. <laughs> these are Amex, PayPal, etc. And basically the business idea is to charge merchants very high fees. They use that to incentivize the consumers to choose them next time around. Mm -hmm. While then on the other far end, you've had private labor credit cards, co-branded cards, who have been very affordable for the merchants. However, unfortunately, not always the best for the consumer with like a lot of like, hey, buy this and then by the way, get on revolving here for 39% interest rate or whatever. So I think really the, the long term equilibrium is probably in the middle where you, f you need to build a service that consumers have preference for that they find is good for them and it works for them. But you also got to do it in a way that's sustainable for your partners and retailers. So I think it's that that's the key to try to find that middle balance. And of course, there, there needs to be mutual trust, which means you have to make sure that you keep fraud at an arm's mm -hmm. length. What do you do to prevent fraud on Klarna? Oh, wow. Um, a lot. <laughs> but I think there's like, I mean, there's tons of things. I think we, we have the benefit of built our stack on modern technologies compared to a lot of the legacy networks and so forth. So that have to backfill. Yeah, exactly. And also, like, if you're, for example, Visa and Mastercard, one of your challenges is that you have so many people to take into account, right? You have the bank who's issuing the card. You have your own network. You then have the acquiring side of the people who are working with merchants acquiring the transactions. You have part PSPs who provide a technical connectivity. So when you want to drive innovation, you are so limited because you need everyone to agree on standards, mm -hmm. everyone to move forward, and that makes those networks slow. The benefit of something like Lana is that we have the direct consumer relationship, so we can just partner with our merchant side only and kind of develop our services forward and, and, and provide you know higher quality of service. And, and, and the same goes for fraud. So, so you know, we invest heavily in you know, real-time monitoring. We do tons of things to prevent fraud. And obviously, it, it is a challenge. It's not, I'm not saying it's easy, but it is, I think, again, we're very fortunate to have built our systems in the last decade rather than in the 50 years ago. <laughs> How do the rates of fraud on Klarna compare to the rates of fraud on other services? Very low. Yeah, they're much below a credit card industry standard. So. Got it. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about consumer protection because mm -hmm. even though your fast growing demo is my generation, a lot of young people use buy now, mm -hmm. pay later services and they end up buying things that they can't always afford. They're, and they're like, I'll, I'll deal with that later when I get to mm -hmm. it. So how do you help ensure that people are only making purchases they'll be able to afford? I know you have this AI that, that approves on mm -hmm. the spot, but oftentimes these are kids who don't have any experience with budgeting. Right, you have to be 18, so I don't know if you refer to people like below. Still every, kids. Yeah, yeah, okay, kids, so it's a matter of definition. But I think that like, um, yeah, I, look, for, first and foremost, like if you look at it, I think if you want to build a long-term sustainable business, you want to make sure that uh, people are using your product in a responsible way, right? And I think, unfortunately, this is what credit cards haven't really done because the ability to overspend is one that has been you know, really incorporated into the concept of a credit card. Yeah, it's their business you, model. Yeah, it's really the business model, right? And I think ours is different. We're not as dependent on it. it. What we try to do now, for example, which I'm really um, enthusiastic about, is what we call uh, real-time underwriting by open banking connectivity. So both in Europe and in the US, there's more and more ability for us to ask the consumers to basically connect their bank accounts, giving us full visibility into all of their financial transactions. And we already have tons of data to suggest that that kind of real-time information is much more powerful to predict uh, people's uh, you know, spending habits and, and, and their propensity for potentially getting into debt. So, um, so that's a really interesting development because if you look at the traditional s scoring systems like a FICO score, whatever, they're often not really real time, they're not really up to date. Yeah. And we've seen also in Europe some legislation coming in some markets where even you know, everyone that borrows consumers' money is forced to kind of report in real time those uh, exposures into a central database that then people have to ping and use in order to underwrite. I mean, historically we've had a lot of like questions like affordability questions and so forth. The, the unfortunate part with those is that they are not really that efficient to reduce uh, credit risk to, and most banks are aware of this. They mm -hmm. actually don't work that well. They may be very relevant on the mortgage and some very big type of uh, purchase like that, or like, or, you know, b borrow a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But on smaller purchases like credit cards and so forth, they don't actually have that much of 
predictability. Mm -hmm. However, what they do, unfortunately, is they create more friction for, for changing. Mm -hmm. So by you know, making it difficult for you to change from one bank to another, you're actually reducing competition, and that's what's created a lot of the uh, you know, too high profits and too little customer mobility that we've seen in banking that has actually made those banks a bit more tired and less competitive in their services. So I think that like, this new ability to kind of connect open banking mm -hmm. in, in allowing us to understand the customer is actually really exciting. So we do tons of that. We also do budgeting tools. We try to provide you with that. And I genuinely believe as we advance our investments into that area that I, we are going to come to a place where one day we're going to tell you, you know what, don't buy that. Right? It's going to happen. Like, we're not there yet to make that. You know, that. And, and it's going to be advised based because every customer in the end has to take their own decision, I believe. Mm -hmm. But to be able to at least tell you, like, are you sure you right want to buy this? Right at the register, you'll yeah. say, you know what, we yeah. recommend that you stay yeah, with yeah. this. Are you sure that this makes sense for you? Like, I think actually at some point in time we'll get to the point where we're going to do that as well. Because I think in the end, what, what, what the internet is driving, digitalization is driving, I really strongly believe this, is it's driving a more perfect market. It, you know, when I was in business school, we were learning about microeconomics and demand and supply, and I looked at it and I was like, this has nothing to do with reality because I didn't see companies act like that at all. Mm -hmm. But the more this has come, I think that like, it's, it's getting more and more perfect. And if you, in a perfect market, the only thing you have to care about is what's the value I'm creating for my customers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how good am I at creating value for you as a consumer? How good am I at protecting your interest and doing what's best for you? And I really think long term that's what's going to drive uh, competitiveness. And then you have to be willing to do things that may feel business counterintuitive, mm. such as saying, don't spend on that. Right. right, or such as supporting regulation, for instance. Exactly, that's another, and we do that in some markets as well, where because obviously as much as we may have that good intentions and we want to build a business like that, I, in general, I'm a, big fan of you know free markets and so forth but I do think sometimes you need to put a little bit of you know rules in place rules in place right otherwise it's just an anarchy mm -hmm. and and you want to have some rules in place to to, to protect uh, for that but you, at the same time those rules need to be written in a way where they don't reduce competition that's always the challenge right so you have smart outcome based regulation that doesn't allow you to reduce competition because that then hurts consumers again what might that look like in the US well, I think one thing that we, for example, in the UK where there's an ongoing legislation for buy now, pay later right now, one thing that we have been suggesting is uh, put outcome-based regulation to me is rather than saying like, you have to do these affordability checks, you have to do this and that, put a KPI and say, your losses cannot be higher than credit cards. Or even tell us they have to be 20% lower than credit cards. Like even put a, you know, put in higher standards. That's yeah. fine, I don't have a problem hitting that. But the benefit of you doing that is you put a KPI, you allow for the innovation. You allow for us innovating, putting technology into place to still allow customer data mobility, to allow consumers to easily switch between services, but really focusing the players in the market to make sure to protect consumers from you know, from harm, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the right way. Rather than saying you have to do it this way, you have to ask these questions. Look at a lot of regulation here in the U.S. as well. Where like on your credit card statement, there's tons yeah. of text. No one reads any of it. Nobody reads anything. It's just you know, it's it doesn't work, right? And so that's just not very good uh, regulation. Better regulation is KPI based, and, and it works in banking. We have you know. Just um, tell us what KPI stands for. Well, KPI key performance indicators, or you know, specific metrics that you need to hit. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you look at like uh, you know the capital require capital accuracy requirements that banks have, right? Those yep. are good examples of metrics that banks have to follow mm -hmm. that actually you know shape the industry and form the industry in the right direction mm -hmm. much better than try to write you know prescriptively do this and that mm -hmm. which usually tends to you know not work and then people f and, and then not so serious players find ways around it anyway in the end right that puts the onus on the companies rather than the consumers which is you know what all those reams of text do at the credit card companies yeah. you know as a consumer you're supposed to read and agree to it and if not you know, too bad, yeah. it was in the fine print. Very good point, actually, I haven't thought about it, but you're totally right. I think that's also another benefit of the outcome-based regulation, that you really focus on that. And I do think businesses have, because you know, that was also one of my insights, right? It's like, I genuinely believe, if you're an entrepreneur today starts a restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. I think that like, yeah, you have some responsibilities. Obviously, I want you to be thoughtful about where you buy the food and, and, and so forth as a customer. But I still think there's a limitation to your responsibility on society in general. But if you take that restaurant as an entrepreneur and make it into McDonald's and you have you know, 5,000 restaurants and you know, whatever, then I do think you have a different level of responsibility <laughs> suddenly versus society and what you do. I do think it changes, right? And I think the same applies to us as a company as well, right? We were small, we started, we're learning, we're adopting, and we have made mistakes. We had revolving accounts, we removed them. We've had overdraft fees, we removed them. Like We've done a lot of these changes as we've gone over right. the years in order to adopt and, 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 and realize them. We've taken a lot of discussions around what you know what is the right type of products in this space. With scale comes responsibility. I really believe so, yeah. Yeah. Whereas so. everyone else, not everyone else, but a lot of people think with scale comes freedom because yeah, exactly. then I can, I can write the rules yeah, or I exactly. can really influence the rules. Where, where do you draw the line between the regulations that should apply to 
buy now, pay later services versus traditional lenders? Well, I don't, Dre. I think probably they should be fairly similar, right? I think you should try to harmonize versus trying to find a, a system that is as equal for all players as possible. But it may not be not always possible, right? Yeah. So. I know. You're talking about a lot of rewriting roles that, mm -hmm. that no one's into right now. Um, let's talk a little bit about the different stages of growth that mm -hmm. you've shepherded Klarna through. Because I imagine that when you first started and you had maybe 100 employees, things were it was easy to get things done. You were nimble. Growth was really quick. Um, but then you enter a new stage where you need to scale, but at the same time keep that trajectory you know, going. And that, that becomes a challenge. Indeed. You almost told the whole story. <laughs> it's very accurate, very, very accurate description. I, this is something that all startup founders yeah, deal yeah. with, right? Well, I think so. I don't know. I guess so. I, I mean, I, for me, at least, I, mean, I was 23 when we started, right? Uh -huh. And so were my co-founders. I think, to your point, as we were a startup, at least to me, it was fairly natural. You would run, you know, you would talk to everyone in the office. You would, you know, focus about you. Everyone was close to the customer because everyone was talking to the customer almost on a daily basis. So, like, what you were supposed to do and what was important felt very natural to everyone. It was easy to align yeah. and agree on. Yeah. I think, then to your point, as as the company grew, you know, especially below, you know, above a couple of hundred people. I at least felt very frustrated. In those years for Klarna was about 2010 to 15. Mm -hmm. And I know that I was very frustrated because I really felt that we were slowing down, we were becoming political. Uh, we hired a lot of senior executives that were going to come in. And, From outside know, the company. Exactly. They brought in their own um, culture, right? Exactly. And, and you know, and didn't necessarily have the full understanding of our business and, yeah. and what it was about. And so those were tough years for me. And I think it wasn't until really 15 when my second co-founder left that I kind of had the opportunity to start rethinking this whole thing. Because also me and him, in the end, we were a little bit like an old couple. <laughs> so we were like, whenever he was saying something, I was like, you're just saying that because, you know, like. And it, it wasn't actually, what's interesting when you reflect on it back, it's like, it wasn't about who was right. Because sometimes he was right and sometimes I. But the point was it created ambiguity internally and it created a lack of certainty around decision making and stuff like that. So it's just not uh, very um, good for the company. So when he left, at least it became very clear, not only that I was in charge, but also when a mistake happened, I couldn't blame him. I had yeah. to blame myself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I had to take accountability for everything suddenly. Sure. And I think that like that then started me really thinking about like, okay, how do we create a company that, how do we regain that momentum that we had as a startup? How do we create like a, a flat organization with fast decision making, agility? So we started experimenting around our operating model a lot. We had already done that. We had put in the ping pong tables and the free sodas and all, you know, 20% creative time was this very big concept in the end of the 2010s because of Bring Google. your pets to work, all of that. My God, right? And nothing really happened, right? It didn't really change anything. Um, so in, in 15, we started really thinking more agile, small teams. Uh, cross-functional teams with people with different backgrounds working together and it had we started seeing it had a tremendous impact on our momentum and our ability to deliver on you know speeding things up I also felt that the kind of uh, density of talent in the company was rising mm -hmm. so it took us like two three years there but it made me very very excited mm -hmm. and that was kind of at the time when we then said okay let's have another look at us what can we do and, and and that's actually a big part to why I think us has been such a success in the last few years we're now you know 22 million customers and the product adoptions that we've done for the US and so forth very much came from those 15 to 18 years when we really reformed the organization. Right, you regrouped company. essentially. Very much so, yeah. Interesting, interesting. So when you think about culture, how do you integrate these middle level senior executives that you import from yeah. outside and make sure that they are steeped in what you believe in and, and you don't get caught up in you know, this sense of patting yourself on the back. You know, we're doing fine, we, mm -hmm. we're maintaining. You want, you want to, recapture some of that hunger from the early years. For sure. Wow, uh, yeah, I could write a book about that. I'm not <laughs> sure even I have the right answers to all of it, but I think that a big piece of it is, right, is really keeping super close to the customer, right? And really trying to make sure everyone in the company, you know, regularly, regularly speaks in, uh, the customer to the customers, both if, in our case, it's both on the kind of merchant, you know, partner side, as well as on the consumer side uses the product themselves. I have this kind of saying that like, if you haven't tried a product, if you haven't talked to a customer, if you haven't talked to a supplier, if you haven't done these things, like you don't know anything, right? right. That's basically it. So I think really being close to the real business, right? And understanding what it looks like and, and, and test it is, um, you know, we do so, it's not only user focus groups because user focus groups are- It's an are, artificial environment. It's part of the artificial, right? So we found another way of doing it where we actually, we pay random people to 
test our products, mm -hmm. and then they, in return for being paid for it, they record the sessions. Mm. So it really becomes like real life uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. And then we bring those recordings to teams internally, and we look at them jointly, and we discuss like what could have been better in this mm. and so forth. And mm -hmm. Things like that actually have a tremendous impact on people's understanding. I think it's really having the customer's kind of interest all the time at the front. And, and also trying to think that your structures internally, how you promote and reward people and so forth, that it's really tied to people that have been able to prove that they have made a meaningful impact on mm -hmm. that customer experience. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies over time, promotions are driven by other things that become very superficial or artificial and doesn't necessarily tie to whether you've created that value for your customers. So I think tons like that and also strong believer in cross competence like we obviously still have some teams in Klarna maybe only marketeers or only legal people whatever but in general when I look through the organization I, I think I've seen that as more cross competence they are as more more teams are mixed mm -hmm. the more productive they are in general like it's it's just really a, a strong ambition of mine to make sure that there's a good mix consistently. People are not siloed all the yes, time. Yes exactly and really the, they almost operate like small startups so every team in Klarna has eight people. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I think Why we know. eight? Because there's a lot of research and science that shows that if you, a group of people is more than nine, ten people, they start splitting into subgroups and so oh, forth. Okay. So like group psychology shows that eight is a fairly good number. Mm -hmm. So you try to keep. That doesn't mean all teams have. To, we're not religious people in that sense. We we don't. We're pragmatic around these these concepts. Mm -hmm. We're very inspired by the Toyota way and how they kind of a lot of like the keeping close and kind of small improvements on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think these things, they really, really work. But it's taken, uh, at least me, many years to recognize, you know, how different what I thought managing right. efficiently was and how I see it today. So you have investors. You mentioned Sequoia, one mm -hmm. of your first big investors. How much do they weigh in with their advice, especially as you were going through that difficult period and you're trying to get your head around the idea that perhaps you're giving up some of the growth and the nimbleness because you're expanding so quickly. Well, I think, you know, Michael Moritz is on my board and our chairman on my board, and he, you know, he's been on Google and YouTube and, and PayPal and tons of others. Well, I've been observing him <laughs> as well for the last 12 years. I think he does something that I try to apply now versus people within the organization, which is that I think he predominantly looks at me and he asks himself, is he working hard? Is he taking his failures seriously? And is he really trying to learn from them and improve? And I think that as long as he sees that I do that, he gives me a lot of leeway. And he's always there when I want support, I want a question. I mean, it's crazy, the man is always available. I can call him at any point of time. If I need like him to open a door for me or make an introduction, he will do tremendous effort to do that. Mm -hmm. But it also gives me tons of leeway to learn on my own, right? Mm -hmm. If I ask something, he may say, look, I, you know, I think that is a good idea or a bad idea. He will give me that. Mm -hmm. But he's not trying to direct me. And I think that in the end, like, that's the environment that I want to create for people at Klan as well. That like, I want them to find themselves in very challenging environments where they're I expect tons of them, and the environment expects tons of them, because I think that's what they should be attracted by coming to us. It shouldn't be an easy job. Mm -hmm. It should be a difficult one, a hard one. But rewarding. But, but rewarding, right? And I think it's a little bit like, I, I, you know, I see that also because when Klana becomes more popular, it's almost like I'm always more worried when we're more popular <laughs> uh, that people want to join the company to be part of the success, but yeah. not necessarily contribute to the success, right? Mm -hmm. I think those are two very different things. And, and I think about it like, you know, a lot of people will look some, oh, look, this amazing people, they clown Mount Everest. And people are like, wow, that's fantastic. But not that many people are willing to freeze off their fingers and do what's necessary to climb that they mountain. They want the picture at the end. Right, exactly, right? And I think that the key essence for us is really like find individuals that really are fascinating by that trio challenge. A lot of people recognize this from their own personal trading or, you know, mm -hmm. other exercises, but they don't necessarily always think about it in their jobs. And I think an environment and job should be challenging but also supportive. And you need to recognize as a leader when, you know, when, where are people on that learning curve? Mm -hmm. Like you want to stretch people mm -hmm. to the point where they're like exhausted, but you don't want to overstretch them. You don't they want to give burn up. them out. Exactly, right? I always refer actually to my, my kids have a swimming teacher. Mm -hmm. Her name is Petra and she's fantastic. I can, I can observe her when she's, you know, she's teaching my, my children who's like four, six and eight, the swimming, mm -hmm. because she has that magic ability to push them exactly to the point where they're like so proud when they come out of the pool because they've done something they didn't believe they could do, but she never pushes them beyond that point where they break down and mm -hmm. feel, I never want to swim again, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like so inspired by that. I think that that's the ultimate leadership, right? Like to be able to find that perfect spot to really develop people and accelerate their development like that, 
and do it in a way where they still feel safe in that environment. And it, it's tricky. I'm not going to say that we've always been able to find a balance. Sometimes it's gone wrong on one or the other side, but I think that's, the, that's what you're striving for. How much does that kind of thinking take up of your time? I mean, is that like 50% of your, of your energy? <laughs> yes, 60%? it's actually very good. Yeah, <laughs> I like how you read me. Um, yeah, I would say 50% of my time is usually the product, you know, um, the banking services, financial services, and the other one, the other 50% is very much on the organization. And yeah. I'm, I'm very fascinated by this because I think it's a, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting topic mm -hmm. that obviously so many companies have tried to apply different ways of working and we hear about different models and stuff like that and really trying to find the right balance. We were discussing it in the management team just a week ago, how a lot of the big tech companies, they have, you know, really tried to create these like performance evaluation models where like in order to get promoted you need to go into committee with 55 people and you know print a paper of all the accomplishments that you've had and so forth and in a way maybe the purpose of that was good because you wanted to create a transparent model you want yeah. to make it clear how you get promoted yeah. but over time whenever you set these gate you know this these rules in place and you make an over complex system people start focusing on how to play the system yes. rather than like really accomplishing something suddenly we're hearing from those tech companies like yeah but if i want to start a great project nobody wants to join because it doesn't fit into my performance thing and like and then you're like wow that was not what was intended from start right so i think i mean it, I like an organization that's organic. I'm very inspired by Nassim Taleb and his anti-fragile th theories about creating an, an, it's almost like it needs to be a little bit organic. It needs to be a little bit crazy. And, and people always get nervous when, you know, banking and crazy is mentioned <laughs> in the same <laughs> sentence. Not a good combination. Not a good combination, but I actually think it is. I think, you know, real stable systems are organic. Um, mm. They are the most anti-fragile. Like if you stress a muscle, it becomes stronger. Mm. Um, solid things, if you stress them, it's just if you apply more stressure, they eventually break. Mm -hmm. So solid is not the solution. The solution is organic things that improve by failure, but you have to set up systems so those failures cannot be you know, fundamental for the, whole or for the whole organization. You have to set up systems so that every failure is small, enough so the and organization controlled in the middle. and controlled so that people can learn from it mm -hmm. and develop and so forth and that creates a true anti-fragile system so i think that like those are things that i'm very you know as you can hear very passionate and, and i think it's very very fascinating so what kind of failures did you experience during the pandemic with people working from home i know you're based mm -hmm. in stockholm and there wasn't necessarily people wearing masks and the pandemic wasn't experienced the same way it was here in north america or perhaps the rest of europe yeah. but what kind of challenges to the culture that you've spent so much time and energy setting up did the pandemic lead to? Well, I think it was an interesting, I mean, the first, I think most uh, senior leaders at that point in time had this question, right, which was like, first it was the decision like, when do you decide if people had to work from home? Mm -hmm. And how quickly did you arrive at that decision uh, before the government kind of made, <laughs> made the job for you? Um, and I think that was exactly one of those examples where, you know, a lot of junior leaders within the companies wanted the, us to decide for them. Uh, and there was a lot of fear, obviously. People were very fearful. What yeah. does it mean to come to the office? Is it dangerous? And so forth. And, and there we had to weigh that because in a, to some degree, when you already when you have, you know, Klan is now five, 6,000 people. People are working in like 40 different offices across the globe where COVID was f more or less advanced. Mm -hmm. Trying to write a rule or decide something that is company-wide is almost impossible. Yeah. And, and so preferably you want to really say that the decision is within you know, the local leaders, the yeah. people who are close to those teams. But also those local leaders are sometimes very junior and to them it's very difficult to take such decisions. They want somebody senior to step in mm -hmm. to help them to and, and reduce that fear that they have. Mm -hmm. So finding that balance like, okay, how mandatory, prescriptive do you make that rule? And in the end, we decided to make it fairly mandatory to release some of the stress from the younger leadership so mm -hmm. that they you know, didn't have to take those decisions. The burden was not on it them. Was, no, because it was too big for them and yeah. they were not there. But now, as we had kind of a few months ago, there was a question, okay, so are we going to go back to office or not and whatever. This time around, we actually said, now there isn't that stress anymore. People are not that afraid. Mm -hmm. Now we're actually going to say, look, every local leader has to decide. Every team has to decide for themselves. But it's the local, you know, the team leader in the end who has to decide for that. They have the authority to decide mm -hmm. for their team mm -hmm. because there are situations where teams need to be in the office for different mm -hmm. reasons and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. But we said it's their decision. And that was because we wanted them to really own that decision and we d don't think that we should provide that guidance. So to me, it's always that like, when are we prescriptive and when are we allowing our leaders to take charge of those questions yeah. and have to develop their own skills and think for themselves. I think any system you put in place that's prescriptive, the problem with it always takes away people's 
you know agency it, yeah exactly and their own decision like it has to you want to promote people to take their own decision mm -hmm. because that's what's training them to really take the right decisions and mm -hmm. think for themselves as much as possible and invest in the decision as well exactly and, right? and be it. responsible for yeah. it and say this is why right otherwise it's just going to be management said so you know mm -hmm. this and that and that creates always that kind of you know foreign feeling that a big organization tends to have that, like nobody right. understands why things are happening and what's the purpose and so forth so really believe in decentralized close decision making as much as possible but occasionally you've got to recognize that now is not the time it was a crisis when COVID came yeah. along then you need to step in right right this is no ordinary situation exactly so we talked about your investor um sequoia you also have a corporate partnership with snoop dogg mm -hmm. right um how did that come about well yeah it's a, it's a good story in itself but i think um actually this was um so we a couple of years ago decided that I think one of the key elements was that we realized, okay, if you look at the traditional ways in which banks try to communicate trust, it was a lot of middle-aged white men in suits in marble offices yes. shaking hands, right? Yes. That was like, in, yes, that's, that's, that's trust, right? And so we, <laughs> we said to ourselves, is it really, you know, are modern consumers associating that with trust? Not so much, right? We saw the Wall Street movement, all this stuff. So we said to ourselves, if we genuinely want to communicate trust, we have to be approachable, available, speaking the language of the customer. And also, if we genuinely over time, because we, the big purposes of Klarna is to save people time, save people money, and make them less worried about their finances. Finances is a boring thing. Most people don't want to think about it, <laughs> which in a way is fair. They should hang out with their friends or be with their kids or do other things than worry about their finances, mm -hmm. hopefully, because they were taken care of by themselves, right? So like that in the best of worlds. So, with that said, but we realized that it's an important topic. And coming through that topic in, in kind of a stiff suit and trying to think that somebody's going to listen, it's just not going to work. Yeah. So then associating ourselves with things like Snoop Dogg <laughs> or people like Snoop Dogg and, and associate ourselves with something different, being willing to express ourselves differently. And it all came down to the word smooth. Mm -hmm. The reason we love smooth so much is because smooth actually represents like one click payment simplicity that was smooth. You can't be like, you wouldn't say that you were unsafe and smooth at the same time, doesn't really make sense. And then smooth is also sometimes, yes, you can like give yourself a little bit of credit, smoothen out your cost. So it kind of associates with that. At the same point of time, smooth is this like beautiful creative world. We can do a lot of fun and exciting things. And uh, part of our team was just sitting one day and they were like, wouldn't it be cool if like this song, Drop It Like It's Hot, would be like, <laughs> start like, because it starts like Snoop. And then they were like, wouldn't it be cool if it was like smooth? And then we started talking to Snoop Dogg and he decided to announce that he was changing names to Smooth Dogg. So, you know, that caught fire on the web and, you know, a lot of people got interested in this and he's actually a shareholder nowadays. So we've done uh, similar things ever since. We, we did it with Lady Gaga, with Asap Rocky and so forth. And I think it's really meaningful. And, and uh, when I was talking to Asap as well, same topic, was was like, okay, how are we going to promote financial awareness? Mm -hmm. You're not going to promote financial awareness by middle-aged white men <laughs> again like that's not going to be <laughs> the way right just be very right. clear about it right so the pink color the different approach the you know the availability is yeah. actually very very meeting you know, customers where they're at yeah exactly and in a way that they can relate to and engage with and they feel is fun and interesting you're not going to have people listen otherwise have you learned anything from snoop or smooth mm -hmm. um as an investor as a spokesperson for the company yeah i think i've learned in, in a way that you know really the idea of of diversity and speaking to everyone and really thinking, you know, and, and also, you know, slightly more creative and crazy and not like sticking with the with the standards. And that, you know, you can imagine us running a bank, we're a fully licensed bank in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the amount of people that come to me and say, you cannot do that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we're in financial services. And so I think that like, it's really nice talking to creative people like Snoop uh, that, you know, to them, everything's possible. Like right, right. Right. Don't say no to that. Exactly. You just haven't explored it. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, you know you're you're in Sweden. You're based in Sweden, and of course your bank there. You're also privately held for now, but mm -hmm. one day you might become publicly traded. You have some, I guess, reservations about becoming a publicly traded company. What do you think investors and the public markets might not totally understand about your business, about your company? No, but I think that the the thing that I worry about is that uh, I. My impression of the public market is that they are fairly short term yeah. and there's a lot of short term capitalism, a lot of focus on quarterly earnings. Mm -hmm. I think it's changed a little bit. I think people like Elon Musk has actually proven that it can change and that a company on the stock market can be appreciated for its but long term success. But not everyone's Elon Musk. But not everyone's Elon Musk, exactly. But I think at least he's shown the way that it's possible. I think Jeff Bezos to some degree as well with Amazon for a long period of time wasn't showing profit and people kind of accepted it. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I think it doesn't have to be that way, but I still believe that there is too much of that tendency. And I'm a little bit worried because, you know, Klon has not been like straight up type of story. It was, you know, we, we did really well the first years and then we kind of parked around the bit $1 billion valuation. We had a lot of investors that gave up on us and wanted to sell their stock and wanted to push the company to IPO. And, you know, fortunately, again, Sequoia, you know, supported us in staying private at that point of time and didn't exit too early. People wanted us to sell the company. Um, so I've seen kind of, I, 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 I was always one of those people who said like, oh, you know, capitalist meritocracy shouldn't have any voting shares, stuff like that. It's not good. I was always against that. But then I started seeing, you know what, like when you're in those situations, some people will have a long term perspective and other will. And everyone will have a self-serving bias to say, I'm 100 percent rational. I'm doing what's right for this company and for the shareholders. But actually, they're driven by you know, how quickly they want to get the money out. Yeah, their time and, frame. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so I think that like, there's so much potential. We're in this trillion dollar industry mm -hmm. called retail banking. We can really, if we do and execute well, we can transform this industry. We can be part of transforming this industry to something better. And I'm just very, very, one of the things I'm really passionate about is to make sure that Klana can live up to its full potential. So that's the thing I'm slightly worried about the public markets. Yeah. But I'm also, I think we're getting to a point where our history and our success might actually allow us to create some of that kind of reputational aura that some of these, you know, Amazon type of companies or Tesla's had mm -hmm. that actually, you know, we could attract investors that, you know, want to bet on Klana long term and so forth. So I'm hoping now that with maybe with the last years of success, we're at that point of time where, you know, I wouldn't be as worried anymore. But, you know, it's, it's still very, very important to me. Yeah. Is, is there a publicly traded retail bank that you admire that you think is doing it well? In I, the sorry, US, I, in Europe? Yeah. I, you know, I think, well, I would still say since Capital One is founder led, if nothing else, I think that's pretty cool that he's still there and running the, the business, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's impressive. Um, but with that said, you know, this is not an industry that there's unfortunately um, a lot of really forward looking leaders that are changing. I, I think some will, some people will step in and try to do it, but it's it more is about protecting what's already there. Very much. And these are so large organizations, a lot of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And then unfortunately, we made them worse by a lot of prescriptive regulation that isn't really helpful, mm -hmm. that just makes them even slower and, and worse. So. All right, let's look ahead here um, mm -hmm. for some fun things here. What, what kind of trends do you see? You collect a lot of data, as you mentioned. Your customers are able to see what they bought and uh, how, how often they bought it in the past. What do you see trend-wise in terms of holiday spending in Europe, in the US? Um, no, I think that like in general, it's very strong to see more sustainable goods more luxury items as well. Actually, luxury has had a tremendous growth rate. Mm. So people are willing to spend more on luxury items. And I think to some degree, you know, there was a perception maybe in media slightly that, you know, people were worse off as part of COVID. And that was obviously partially true, but it's a minority of people that has been financially impacted by COVID. Mm -hmm. The majority of people were on a savings program for 12 months and, and, and didn't spend a lot. I mean, they spent a bit more online, but nothing compared to what they saved spending, not spending in stores. And so people's balance sheets are stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. um, they pay down tremendous amount of debt. I mean, credit card rate debt in, 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 in US fell off a cliff, right? And, which is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, savings went up. Mm -hmm. Some of that on f may have been put in a little bit of Bitcoin and other uh, asset classes like that. But I think that like in a lot of we saw retail investment on the stock market go from maybe 10 percent to 25 percent. Right. So okay. you've seen some of that. But also people actually being slightly more thoughtful about because they can afford to, to buy that item that is a little bit more long term, sustainable, a yeah. little bit higher quality. Luxury has grown as a consequence of that. I think that's definitely very persistent across the board. Um, no, obviously, unfortunately, there are a subset of, of consumers that have been financially impacted in a bad way, and it's not true for them. But, but for the majority, that's true. Okay, so pickup in luxury spending. Venmo, is that a friend or a foe? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think that, like, you will have these peer-to-peer -peer services. Uh, I mean, we've seen Square Cash App as well do that. I think there's, that's definitely going to be. But I think over time, we will see them become networking, meaning that it won't be tied to a single provider. Mm -hmm. They will eventually you know, become ubiquitous and you can shift money between people's accounts independently of for that. I think, I think that's still where the, the long term. What about, about crypto, friend or foe? 
<laughs> I look. I, I think from our perspective, we have chosen so far to not. I mean, we we're different as well. If you look at like the, uh, the Robin Hoods of the world, and even some of the neo banks in Europe, like Revolut and so forth, they're into trading. We're not a trading bank. Like we're we are focusing on retail banking, meaning like people's everyday spend, mm -hmm. shopping, purchases, kind of like your everyday economy. If you want to trade, go to a niche bank that is good at trading. Well, what if someone gets their salary in Bitcoin? Well, if they do get their salary in Bitcoin, they at some point in time need to use it in normal dollars as well. So, <laughs> so I mean, to us, it's just it's not a technology that we've seen for our consumers solve a real life problem, and that's why we haven't applied it. Um, but as you're an not, asset you're class, you're not writing it off yet. As no, I mean, as a, first and foremost, as an asset class, I mean, some people like to put money in that. Some people put it in, you know, stock, and some people put it in Rembrandt paintings. Mm -hmm. Preferably, I put a Rembrandt painting if I, you know. But but again, that's a matter of tastes. Like, okay, that's um, that's all the time we have for right now. But I really want to thank you for your time today. And we are uh, speaking with co-founder and the CEO of Klarna, Sebastian Sima. Simiatkovsky. Did I get that right? You did. Okay. I had to practice that several <laughs> times. Um, before we let you go, we want to bring in closing remarks from Fernando Gomez Baquero. He is Cornell Tech's director of Runway and Spinouts, and we'll go to him now. Fernando? Hello, everybody. I'm Fernando Gomez Baquero. I'm the director of Runway and Spinouts at the Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute at Cornell Tech. And what a wonderful way of ending this year. Uh, and by hearing Sebastian with such an amazing story. You know, one of these sectors where you continue to see disruption and innovation and where you think that nothing is invented, but all of a sudden you see a company like Klarna doing the things that seem obvious, but at that point in time, it weren't. So I think that we learned a lot of interesting things from Sebastian. One is resiliency, really getting to this idea and uh, working on it over the long run. Remember that Klarna was... Uh, really started in 2005. So it's been more than 16 years for this company to work on disrupting the market. The second one is being there, riding the wave, getting into the right moment and really delivering that value that they always knew that they could deliver. And finally, building a brand that is amazing, building a brand that people can trust, that people can love. That's also very important for uh, a big company. So I hope that this is a great experience for you. I think it was a wonderful way of seeing uh, an entrepreneur that really got in there and built a company from the unlikeliest of places uh, from our point of view. But that also shows you that innovation is global. Innovation is ubiquitous. Uh, and you just have to be very persistent, be entrepreneurial, uh, be able to drive that innovation that you want to drive. Uh, and then you'll bring amazing things to the world. Uh, so with that, we end up this year, and I wish for all of you uh, the most happiest holidays and new year.